Hello, everybody. I'm just uh, letting everyone in. It may take a few moments. In the meantime, if I could just get a quick thumbs up or uh, wave to make sure that my sound is working okay, that would be wonderful. And everyone has been muted on entry. So I think, uh, oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so everyone's muted on entry. If you're not, um, just double check. It appears that is the way it's functioning, which is the way we want that to work. So we'll just wait uh, one more minute to let some people through and then we'll get started. Okay, make sure I have done everything I needed to, great. Um, once again, uh, welcome to our lecture series. Um, this is the third and final lecture in Dr. Uh, Stanky's upper extremity lecture series. Tonight, as you know, we are talking all about the hand and the wrist. Uh, uh, for those of you that have been with us throughout this lecture series, welcome back. It has been great to have your keen interest in questions along the way. If this is your first upper extremity lecture, we welcome you. Thanks to everyone for joining us on this beautiful evening. Your time and attention are not something that we take for granted. For anyone who has not met me yet, uh, my name is Renee Westmacott and I am your co-host for the evening. I will be standing by for any questions that might come up. If they are relevant, I will raise my hand and interrupt Dr. Evan. If not, we will we will have some time to review the questions at the end of the lecture. In addition, you can stay, uh, feel free to stay on the call at the end to ask any further questions that may have come up. Um, let me share a little bit about Dr. Steinke. Um, Dr. Evan Steinke joined the Active Sports Therapy Westman chiropractic team um, at the beginning of May, 2022. Um, Dr. Steinke brings a wealth of knowledge and information to the AST team, and we are thrilled to have him on board. He has a great understanding of how to connect with patients and put their needs first. You can book in with Dr. Stanky at uh, AST Westman. All the contact information will be available at the end of the lecture and in the follow-up emails. Um, that is all for me for now. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Evan Stanky. Doctor, welcome, Dr. Evan. <laughs> thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear Perfect. you. Uh, well, thank you for that introduction and welcome everyone to part three of the Upper Extremity Series. This is the last one. Um, we'll be covering, covering the wrist and the hand today. Now, don't worry if you missed the first two parts, they are available on the, uh, the YouTube channel. And again, there's going to be a link to that at the end, just in case you want to watch those um, at any time. So we're going to dive right in today, and I'm going to start with kind of an overview. We're going to touch on the general anatomy again. Uh, anatomy really is the baseline for, for all of these conditions that we're going to be covering. So just some basic understanding of what's going on not only helps us understand why the injury happened, but how we can best manage it and treat it. Um, so I'll, I'll be covering some of that, and then we're going to cover common injuries. So stuff related to the bones, the joints, the nerves, all of the, the muscles involved as well. We'll cover some of the more common ones we see in the clinic. Uh, and then I'm gonna go over what as a chiropractor I can do for treatment and management of, of these different cases. And then what can you do? What prevention, home care, the exercises and stretches that are available uh, to you to do at home. Uh, and then, like she said, at the end, we're going to be uh, opening up the floor, any questions, and not only for, for hands at this point, if you, don't, if you still have a question about shoulder or something, by all means, um, ask that too. Um, my qualifications are I have a Bachelor's of Science in Human Biology as well as uh, I'm a Doctor of Chiropractic, both from the University of Western States in Portland. Uh, so let's dive in with some anatomy. So if we just kind of zoom out for a second and we look from, from kind of a stand back uh, point of view, we immediately notice that the hand is quite different than the rest of the body. Okay, so if we look at this image on the left, we can see that there's a lot of tendons, a lot of those white fine um, connective tissues running all the way from the, the forearm to your fingertip. 
And then the muscles that are involved are really only um, in the palm. After the first knuckle, there's no more red, right? There's no more muscles in your arms, or, or sorry, in your fingertips, right? At that point, it's all connective tissue. And you can even just feel that, right? Your, your fingers, pretty quite bony. Um, there's no, there's no uh, muscle in there, okay? So that's something we can just pick up by just looking at it. And then on the right hand side, we have uh, the arteries in red and we have the nerves in yellow. So we can see that each fingertip is getting innervated um, kind of on each side by a set of nerves and a set of, of, of arteries. Um, we're not gonna touch too much on arteries, but sometimes it does come into play. So if you have questions about that, please ask. Usually this is stuff like um, if a ring is too tight, you might start noticing a, a kind of an odd sensation in that finger. Um, sometimes there's traumas that go on, which we'll talk a bit about as well, okay? So how did we get here? Uh, the, the upper extremity, let me just move this chat box for just a sec. Okay, so how did we get here? The upper extremity um, starts off at your shoulder blade. This is where the whole arm is connecting into the, the rest of your skeleton, essentially. Then you have that really thick, strong humerus, which is your upper arm bone. And then the forearm, that's your radius and your ulna. And we touched a bit on this before. A lot of those muscles that come from that forearm, um, they, they run all the way down into the palm, into the fingers. So um, some of those muscles we'll be touching on uh, again today. Also, one thing to note is the kind of supination pronation, that twisting your thumb up and down, that rotation-like movement, that's from the forearm and not so much the wrist, okay? And then after the forearm, we get into this whole series of bones in the, in the, in the hand. It's kind of overwhelming. So let's, let's break it down. So if we, go, if we go to the next, there we go. Okay, so we have the carpal bones. This makes up the base of your palm. Um, so these bones are kind of these compacted, roundish, uh, oval-like bones. They're all really crammed together at the very base of your palm. They supply just kind of a base structure for the rest of your palm to be built on. And the word carpal might sound new, but you've probably already heard of it. Carpal tunnel syndrome, is, is exactly what it sounds like. There's a, there's a small tunnel-like structure that we'll cover later as well um, that stems from these. So you've probably already heard of them. Uh, above them, we have something called metacarpals, and this is what makes up the base of your palm. So you can even just squeeze through your palm. You're gonna feel these long rod-like bones that are running towards each knuckle, okay? So that's your metacarpals. And in between them, there's a series of muscles um, and, and they provide different functions that give us all that great movement through our fingers. And then lastly, we have the phalanges or the fingers, and this is after the knuckles. Um, and we have three knuckles that provide us a huge amount of, of range of motion so that we can grip and grasp things, which is really important. Uh, in terms of naming, we use these so common that we usually, you know, thumb, index, middle, ring, and pinky finger. But in terms of medical, we, we always number them. So um, thumb always starts as one, and then we kind of count from there, two, three, four, five. This comes into play, especially when we start to look at uh, similar structures in other animals. And I, I just wanted to share some of that with you guys. So there's something called homologies, and this is how hands and arms and, and basically similar structures look in other animals. It's really interesting. So if we go over to, for example, the turtle in the first image, looks remarkably similar to a human hand. It's just kind of squished and broad, right? Um, the dolphin is even more squished and even more broad into that fin shape. Horses, um, really interesting here. They, they've elongated their, their um, metacarpals, which is that blue bone um, the, at the bottom there. And then they completely stand on their middle finger, number three, right? So you can see that they've really changed the way that their bone structure works. Um, the way birds and, and, and bats have, have evolved are, are similar in that they have all of these bones reaching out to the, the very end in bats, right? So they stretch the skin thin between these bones Whereas birds have rigid feathers, so they don't even need to stretch all the way to the end. So all their bones are kind of compact up to the top. But you can see that it's really quite similar between such diverse species. And in fact, the one I always found the most interesting was cats. They look 
just like humans, right? If, if you compare them next to each other, they're really, really similar. So um, it's, a, it's an interesting give and take of, of how things have uh, evolved over time. But let's get into some bony conditions that you might see, okay? The, probably the most common thing that we get uh, in terms of, of joint and bony issues is arthritis. We get it all the time in our office. Um, and it can be kind of daunting. There's so many different kinds and I'm gonna just break it down and simplify it. So typically what it will look like, um, hands, you might get these things uh, called Heberdeen nodes or Bouchard nodes. Pretty common to see these. Um, sometimes your grandparents, or maybe even you have them. Um, it's right on the joint and it almost looks like a, like a bony ball on the joint. And that's because it's starting to degenerate. And this can be a sign um, that arthritis has started. So let's break down arthritis into its various uh, um, categories. So there's degenerative, inflammatory, and metabolic. Degenerative arthritis is typically uh, what we think of as osteoarthritis. This is exactly what it sounds like. It's degeneration over time. So you might get wear and tear. Um, you can see in that image, there's cartilage loss, there's changes to the bone structure, right? It's, it's degeneration of the joint. Um, inflammatory, you're going to start to see inflammation. So you might get that redness, that swelling, um, heat over the joint, which is represented in this image as that kind of red light glow around the joint. And then you might get metabolic, uh, which is something, gout is probably the most common kind of metabolic that we'll see. And this is caused by something called uric acid. Now, uric acid is found in some of the foods that we eat, such as red meats will have it. And if it makes its way into a joint, it can actually crystallize. And this is where the problem starts. So I'll show you an image. They become these like razor sharp little crystals in the joint. And basically it's cutting up the joint from the inside out. And what that leads to is that big amount of swelling, that pain in the joint. Um, typically this is focal to, to one joint and it's almost always this big toe, uh, the, the one illustrated right here. It's possible to get it in, in, say, like a knee, but again, it's almost always at this joint. Um, typically for this treatment-wise, it, it's managing somebody's diet so that there's not so much uric acid in it. Sometimes you can take medications to try to bring that level down, um, but finding a balance that works for the, the person is kind of the best route forward. Uh, I wanna dive into some of these a bit more. So let's start with the degenerative category. So this is that osteoarthritis. Sometimes it's referred to as excuse me, degenerative joint disease um, or non-inflammatory arthritis. So there's a lot of names, but all of it is pointing to that it's wear and tear that doesn't have inflammation in it, okay? What does this look like? Well, typically it's morning stiffness and pain. This might last maybe 30 minutes or so. And once you're getting around through your day, you're gonna be feeling a bit better um, and the pain might start to lessen you'll start to get bony growth. Sometimes this is even visual. You'll see kind of like the knee seems like it's bigger than it used to be. Um, sometimes you get these little bone spurs, which you can see on this image, right? They, they kind of grow in towards the joint and around it. This can become painful if the joints begin to uh, like collide into each other or press in, um, because one of the other things you'll see is joint narrowing. As that cartilage wears out, as the meniscus is, is lessened, the joint's getting closer and closer. Now this doesn't always have to be symmetrical. Maybe the inside of the joint is more lost uh, than the outside, or maybe it's only on the right knee and you don't see it on the left. Um, that's definitely possible in a condition like this. Um, but also if you took a, like a blood sample of this, you would expect the lab results to be normal. Okay, and that's gonna be different than when we look at inflammatory. So if we jump over to that inflammatory type arthritis, you're still gonna get that morning stiffness and pain, but typically it's gonna last even longer. So you might be going maybe like an hour or longer before that pain is starting to feel like, oh, it's easing up in the day, okay? You'll still get that joint narrowing, but you're gonna get even more erosion of that joint. So you start to get um, this kind of irregular look to the joint. So if you look at the right hand uh, image here, the right hand is starting to get what we call like a swan neck, okay? So that kind of like S-like shape to it. Um, and this is when the arthritis starts to build up to a point where the joints are eroding and the, and the shape of the joint is changing. 
So it might be red, it might be swollen, all those signs of inflammation, right? Warmth, tender to the touch. It might be a, a loss of function, like you, you're having a harder time gripping objects, uh, which can be a big quality of life change. Uh, and then a major difference here is if, if we took a lab result of this, we would expect to find the inflammatory markers, the, the um, sometimes it's called rheumatoid factor. You might expect to find something like that in, in their blood um, because of, of this inflammatory process that's causing this joint change, okay? Um, typically also, it, it tends to be symmetrical. So if you kind of get it in one hand, you're kind of expecting to have it in the other, um, and it's going to usually affect multiple joints. So kind of all of the knuckles at the same time. Um, so you kind of see this change in most of the fingers, okay? Um, one question I get all the time, all the time, is cracking your knuckles bad for you, okay? This is constantly asked to me and I can say that it is a very common misconception. Um, cracking your knuckles does not give you arthritis, which is, is what I hear a lot. Um, it's been shown that there's no evidence for that to be true. However, um, a bit of an asterisk here, if you're a habitual cracker, and I mean, you're cracking your knuckles like every 20, 30 minutes, just kind of all day, then there are sometimes some undesirable effects. So that might be swelling in the knuckles, it might be reduced grip strength, um, these sorts of, of effects. So if you're cracking your knuckles here and there, I'm really not concerned about it. It's not gonna give you arthritis. Um, it's just kind of a, a myth that's really got out of hand. It's, it's not true. <laughs> um, so I hope that helps clarify uh, cracking knuckles. It can still be annoying though. Some people really just don't like the sound. Uh, so let's go to the next layer. So after bones, what do we have? We have ligaments. This is that strong, connective, fibrous, connective tissue that's that's holding everything together. So if we took an x-ray of your hand, uh, of the wrist, this is what you'd see. You'd see all these bones that look like they're free floating, that they could just move around at any second. Um, it's almost like, why wouldn't one just pop out? And the reason for that is ligaments. So here we can see just how many there are. There's even more than are in this image. They are just everywhere. And they're holding everything together pretty tightly, okay? And what that allows it to do is still move a little bit, but um, prevents anyone from kind of uh, getting out of place dislocated, okay? Um, one thing I will mention is enough force, it's still going to move. There is a chance to dislocate. Um, typically, you'll start to lose that kind of wrist range of motion because uh, a bone's out of place. Um, and there is a chance to still fracture them if, if you push hard enough. In fact, the most common um, fractured carpal is what we call your scaphoid, okay? So that's the one I've circled here. And you can see uh, it's got a big crack right through it, right? Um, this accounts for more than 50% of carpals that are broken. So if you break one, most, most likely it's this one. Uh, unfortunately, it's also one that we really don't want you to break, okay? <laughs> because um, the blood supply to the lower part of this is not fantastic. So it's something you definitely need to come in for. We can assess you for it, um, but we gotta make sure that it's healing. So that's usually gonna be, mean taking an image uh, like an x-ray to see if it's broken. It can take two to three weeks though uh, to show up as a fracture. So even if you hit uh, all the signs and then the image is negative, we're still gonna assume you have it and we're gonna follow through with care to make sure that this heals correctly. Because if the blood supply doesn't start to fuse this together, it can basically pull off into its own island. It's not getting any blood supply and it'll, it'll basically die off. And that can cause a whole bunch of other symptoms that we don't want you to have. So this is something we do really take serious. So if you're worried that you broke your wrist, please, please, please get it examined, okay? Uh, ganglion cysts. Now this, I always find this one so interesting. Um, ganglion cysts are not so much a ligament, but they're a joint capsule that has swollen up. Typically it's from a trauma. If you kind of fell with an outstretched arm, um, gymnasts are really prone to this because they're constantly flexing their wrists and extending them all the time. And what happens is part of that capsule begins to create a stem and it, it kind of um, creates a pouch and it's fluid filled. So it gets pushed further and further out until it's on the surface. And then it kind of balloons out like a, like a mushroom almost. And I've had people come in, had absolutely no idea they even had one. And 
I just, you know, I, I let them know that we can, we can watch this and monitor it. Typically they're self-resolving. Um, here, they're kind of extreme. They're pretty big in this image. They can be, you know, half a quarter of the size, right? Um, and it's gonna be kind of a soft, semi-firm press when you press on them because they, again, they're fluid filled with joint fluid, which is kind of like a clearish yellow viscous fluid um, that lets joints move really well on each other. So what do we do to help people with these? Well, one, we will watch full weight because more often than not, they will resolve by themselves. Your body can take care of this. If it's becoming something that you're worried about cosmetics, it feels like it's unsightly, maybe you have um, some symptoms with it, some wrist pain, that sort of stuff. There are approaches we can take. Typically we'll send you to an MD um, or, or even a nurse can sometimes do this. They'll, they'll stick a needle in it and they'll drain it. It's called an aspiration. Um, and that can bring it all out. Sometimes it does fill up again, in which case, if it fills up enough times recurrent, they'll just go in and they'll just snip it out the stock and, and just a small surgery and it'll be done with. Um, there is a third method that I'm just gonna bring up because it, it, it's a possibility if you Google this, it's called the Bible thump method. And you take a big, big book and you smash it. And now I cannot recommend strongly enough to not do this. Please, 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 okay? No matter what you do, um, let's not do this because what happens is you, 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 you do burst it. It might go down. Okay. But the fluid is still in there. Um, and it has a higher chance of reoccurrence and you, you might damage some of the other structures in there. So a big no, no on that and a big yes, on getting it aspirated. Okay. That's the goal here. <laughs> okay. Uh, I want to talk about ligaments a little bit more because they're really interesting in the hand. So we have, um, uh, what we call pulleys. And what these are is they keep our tendons tucked right up against the bone. Because if you think about it, if you drew like, a, like a, if you put a string on the tip of your finger and then put it where the muscle contracts on your elbow, if you imagine pulling that line straight down, it would be a straight line from your fingertip right to your elbow. But when we contract our finger, it's not bowing out like that. It's all up against our finger. And the reason for that uh, is these pulleys. So if you imagine a fishing line, it's the exact same concept, right? So the, the backbone of the fishing line, that's your finger. And then all those guides that are guiding the, uh, the fishing line in, those are the pulleys, right? So these guys right here. So instead of having a straight line, um, you're actually going between each guide, between each pulley in your, in your hand. Now I bring this up because there, there's a possibility that they rupture. Okay, so let me show you an example. Here we have the tendon, uh, just highlighted it in yellow so you can see that. And you see all these banding structures that are going over top of it. Now, if they rupture, like on the right here, so A2, A3, A4 have ruptured in this case, the tendon now goes in a straight line between the two. Okay, and I'll show you in a real life example of this. So you can see on this person's finger, the tendon's popping all the way up into their palm. Okay, and then here uh, on the right, when they bend their knuckle, instead of following line A like it should, it's now moving to line B. Um, this is possible in anybody that's lifting heavy things, um, particularly uh, rock climbers get this. Sometimes they're hanging their whole body weight off of just one, two, three fingers. And it's so much weight on such a small little tendon um, that it's, it's possible to rupture, okay? So what do we do for this? We would splint the finger, um, let it repair itself. For the most part, you don't need surgery. It's possible that if you, if you did it you know, severe enough, you would, but we would probably try conservative care first. So a bit of rehab programs, some strengthening exercises. Uh, and the key thing is, is if, if, if you're worried about something like this, or we had one in the past, uh, get prepared, tape your finger. And there's all sorts of guides on, on how to do this, but essentially you don't wanna cut off uh, blood supply. So you just wanna wrap it um, around the joints to, to provide um, that kind of external support so that these don't happen in the future. Uh, okay, the next layer, the muscles. There's so many in the hand, there really is. Um, and even more in the, in the forearm that are controlling it. So I'm just gonna kind of clump them together by function. So if, if, you look at your, if you look at your palm side of your hand, you can immediately notice that the base of your thumb has a big chunk of muscle, right? Right at the base, you can feel how that's kind of raised up, okay? So we call that the thenar. So I just circled that in red. 
And that's all of these intricate muscles that are overlapping with each other and they provide a huge amount of dexterity. That's why we can kind of move our thumbs in so many directions and, and with such strength is because of all of these and more in the forearm. Uh, and then likewise, on the opposite side, you might see a kind of a divot in the palm and then it comes up again on the pinky side. We call this side the hypothene arm. So that's what I've circled with the second one. These muscles are helping with uh, pinky control. So grasping reflexes, that sort of stuff. So if you imagine kind of, or you can even do it, just pinch your thumb and your pinky together and you will see how, you know, your thumb and your, and your, uh, the hypothenar below your pinky are doing all of that work, right? There's so many muscles in there providing all sorts of dexterity. Um, and then below that, um, on these last two images, we have what we call inter which means between um, bone muscles. So these are crammed right in the middle of the palm between those bones we found earlier, right? And this is what lets you do the Spock sign, right? I'm not very good at it. I need some help. But that's what lets you, oh, so Renee's really good. She can do it. Perfect. But that's what lets you do that. So it moves your fingers away from each other and brings them back in. So that's what's controlling all of that, okay? Um, really tiny muscles, but you know we don't use them um, for a lot of, of strength. It's more for positioning, uh, if anything, right? Okay, let's dive into the last layer. So this is nerves. So we have the median, the ulnar, and the radial nerve. Um, we did touch on these a little bit in the past. So these are nerves that are not only innervating your hand, but they're kind of innervating everything along the way to your hand. So your shoulder, your forearm, um, but particularly they are giving you a huge amount of sensation. And if you think about kind of, um, if you were to map the human body about how many nerve endings are in what spot, the hand is your go-to, okay? The hand has so, so many nerve endings, which make these nerves kind of extra important in, in our day-to-day -day lives, okay? Um, so we're gonna touch on a couple of these. And the first one is the ulnar nerve. So this is the one that follows your pinky. Um, and you can see that it's going all the way down the pinky and kind of halfway down the, uh, the ring finger, okay? Um, and that's providing sensation, so light touch, um, feelings of temperature, all of that sort of stuff is going through these nerves. It's also controlling some of the muscles, okay? Um, it can get pinched just above the wrist, kind of, kind of in the wrist itself. So I'll, I'll zoom in here. Um, and this is what the tunnel of Guillain is, okay? Or sometimes called the Guillain's canal. It's right between these two bones, okay? And I'm gonna have you find this in a second. And what happens is as the nerve passes through there, it can get a little bit compressed. Um, this could cause symptoms into those fingers, right? The pinky and kind of part of the ring finger. So let's try it for a second, okay? I wanna see if everybody can find this pisiform bone, okay? It's a small round bone. Uh, it's this one I highlighted in red. So what you're going to do is you're going to follow your pinky all the way down to the base of your wrist. And I'm actually, I'm just going to turn off my screen share. Okay. Is my picture bigger? Can people see me now? Okay. So let me pull myself up. Okay. So if we follow our pinky all the way down to our wrist, right on the edge here, if you feel around there, there should be kind of a, a pea-like bone that you can feel. It's about the size of a pea. It's round, just like it. And if you feel that, you're on the spot. So right about here. So what I want people to do is just kind of put your thumb on it. And then you're going to glide a little bit up and in. And you're just going to kind of press just off of that. And you can bring your fingers down and just kind of press in there and see medium pressure and see if you feel anything. I immediately feel a tingle down into my pinky finger. Do you feel it, Renee? Yeah, so you can feel it go down there, right? Do and that's exactly where you're, what was that? Is it strange that I feel it in my elbow? I feel it like- That's where the nerve is starting. So it's not too big of a surprise, right? Cause it's running all the way along. So if you press it here, usually the symptoms are, are more distal. That's the first place you'll feel it, but not surprised cause that's where the nerve's starting. So that's the tunnel of Guillain, okay? And um, the concern here is if, if somebody is experiencing symptoms um, that are in line with you know, the pinky and the ring finger, we want to address this area. And 
Um, some things that we can do here. Oh, let me just finish. So the, the nerve passes right through there. So I want you guys pressing roughly where that blue arrow is. Not too hard, just to see if you can feel it. And everybody has a different level of susceptibility. So if you're not feeling it yet, no concern, okay? Um, what we would want to do is if there was a trauma to the area, if the, you know, if it got fractured at some point, um, dislocated, sometimes when it gets replaced or regrows, um, it, it presses on that nerve. So either we're going to adjust or going to um, try to free up the nerve with various techniques so that you're no longer feeling those symptoms. Okay. Um, the next thing I did want to cover was carpal tunnel. Okay, so this is probably the bread and butter. Everybody's really heard of this one. This is the major wrist thing that we all hear about, okay? Um, this provides the rest of your hand with sensation, right? So you can see it's the front of the thumb, the uh, index finger, the middle finger, and the remaining part of your ring finger, okay? So that is what your median nerve is, is um, supplying. Now, if we look at this image on the right, right at the wrist there, if I took a cross section of that, that's what the image on the right is, okay? So that's what we're looking at, kind of uh, up and down. Now, you can see the bones. Um, they're kind of the, the, the beige, color, beige color there, and they produce kind of a valley. And you can see, I'm gonna highlight it in red, that that is the base for your carpal tunnel. Okay, and it's capped off on the top, which I highlighted in yellow, by a ligament. So that's what's creating the tunnel. And there's a huge amount of tendons that are running in there to supply your fingers and your wrists so that you can flex all the time, right? Now, imagine all of those running back and forth every time you're controlling your wrist, um, but they're actually right next to a nerve right there. So it's pretty easy to, if you get tendonitis, if you get uh, an injury to this area, if there's swelling involved, it's gonna press right against that nerve and you're gonna have the symptoms of carpal tunnel. You get that numbness, that tingling, sometimes pain, irritation uh, into the, the fingers, okay? So what we would do for this is, there's, there's wide variety of treatments, which I'll, I'll cover in a bit, but typically what we wanna do is, is in some way, give that nerve space. That's the main goal, okay? Uh, and then there always is the possibility for surgery for these, okay? I always, always recommend start with a conservative care first, okay? Come see a chiropractor, see a physiotherapist, because um, some people do get the surgery and they get it and no change. You want to make sure that this really truly is the area that the nerve is getting pinched. We did cover last time something called pronator Terry syndrome, where um, the same nerve is getting pinched at the elbow, right? So there's, there's various reasons. So always start there, okay? The surgery itself, not, not too invasive, but they will just kind of go in there and they'll snip uh, what was the roof of, of that uh, tunnel off. So they'll open it up and now there's more room, right? So there's less compression on the nerve. So you won't get so many symptoms anymore. Um, so I'm gonna kind of clump the, the management of wrist issues in, into a lot of the stuff that we can do and kind of break it down for each condition this way. So adjustments, um, these are really commonly used for if we feel like a bone, bone or joint is not moving or is in the incorrect location. Um, so partial dislocations, that sort of stuff, we're, we'll be uh, adjusting those, okay? Long axis distraction, this is when you take a joint and you pull along the axis. So uh, for example, if you had your finger pointing, you pull the finger in the direction it's pointing. So you're kind of gapping the joint and that can help the fluid move around. It can help it um, remove any of those inflammatory factors that might be in there uh, as well. So that's that's a really great one for, for any number of joint pain. If it's maybe um, like a low-grade mild arthritis, this might be something we would consider. Um, soft tissue release, we're huge on this at, at AST. This is something that's super, super helpful. So this could fall under something like MRT, ART. Um, and what, what the goal here is, is to relax the muscle so that the joints can move properly, remove any tension in there um, and get uh, the tissue starting to uh, basically restore itself towards normal, okay? Um, instrument assisted is also uh, something that we can perform. This is the image in the bottom right. So we use specialized, um, typically metal tools that are 
have all sorts of curves and shapes to match the body. And the goal here is to release a muscle um, or even the fascia, which is that, that kind of connective tissue surrounding the muscle, uh, relieve any adhesions. So this might be, you know, hand cramps is something we see it every once in a while. You know, people, people's hands are cramping a lot. Um, that might be a good option for something like that. Cross friction massage. Um, this is slowly being replaced, I feel, by uh, something like shock wave therapy, but it's still a viable option. What you do is you kind of rapidly and almost vigorously massage the tissue um, over in, in a perpendicular direction. So for a lot of the wrist structures, we're going straight into the fingers. So we would be going against the, uh, I guess, against the grain, right? And that can help break up um, scar tissue that might have formed in certain areas from chronic injuries um, and just help bring some of the function back. We always have a huge list of modalities we can use. So this is stuff like laser, which is the one imaged here. That's providing some energy to uh, help with tissue repair. IFC, uh, it stands for interferential current. This is um, where you put those pads on and it's something, it's kind of like a Dr. Ho is a really common um, kind of household version. It's like a TENS unit. And what that does is the pads provide electricity stimulus to the muscles, so it can really help move things. Uh, ultrasound is going to provide a nice deep heat uh, to a, a joint that might need it. Uh, and then game ready is more for like the acute injuries. This is a, a sleeve that you might put uh, over top of an injured area that provides like an ice bath, basically. Um, it really helps bring that inflammation down to a more manageable level so that we can start working on it. Uh, and then lastly is K-tape. I get a little more iffy about people doing their own K-tape around their fingers and their wrists, just because the circulation is becoming, um, you know, the arteries there are, are, are smaller, the circulation, we don't want it to get cut off at all. Um, but it's definitely still something you can do. I just recommend getting a, a professional to do it. Um, we do K-taping as well. I, I do lots of it. But essentially what it is, is it's that stretchy elastic tape. We're gonna put it over the structures that might need some extra support. Um, if it was you know, a recent injury or, or you're, you know a big day or event is coming up and you just need a little bit extra, K-tape, great, great option for something like that, okay? Uh, let's go to prevention and home care. Like what, what can you do at home? Now, the, the first thing in terms of prevention is you have to know what was causing your injury. Okay, so was it a, a one-time trauma? Was it a sports injury? Um, you know, how can we prevent that in the future? Were you wearing the protective gear? Were your mechanics right? That sort of stuff. For the most part, these tend to be repetitive things. Um, so in that case, you know, taking a break from it, changing the tool, even the hand that you're using, if it's possible. Uh, in ergonomics, right? We always, always deal with people's ergonomics because. The reality is, is if you're in a position for you know six, seven more hours a day, you need to be in that position well, right? You, you can't be um, in in a in a state where you're prone to injury. So we we always deal with that. Um, things that you can do reduce the inflammation. So if you rest, your body will slowly take care of it itself. If it's a new injury, I'd recommend icing for sure. Um, for the hand, it doesn't take as long. I wouldn't so much go to the 15, maybe 10 minutes on, 10 minutes off. Um, it's just a smaller muscle for the most part. Uh, and the medication. So this is stuff like ibuprofen, um, over-the-counter stuff, uh, Tylenols, Motrins, uh, Advil. These can help bring down some inflammation uh, in the area. So that's a nice way to, to do a bit of home care. Uh, and then let's get into some stretching. The wrist stretch. Uh, rich wrist stretches I showed you last time. Uh, these are, are excellent even for the, um, the forearm, like golfers and tennis elbow, but also for any injury in there. And the reason for that is again, the muscles in the forearm, but the tendon is stretching all the way to the fingertip. So you still wanna do, you know, the ones where, you know, palm, palm down, you're, you're pulling them in. And again, you'll probably feel it in the wrist. You might even feel it all the way back to um, your forearm. That's okay. We wanna stretch these um, over their entire uh, distance, right? Um, some of the exercises more specific to the hand. Um, in the middle here, I'm, I have an example of what we call theraputty. It's a lot like silly putty. It's just like a little more stiff, a little more solid. 
Um, and the advantage here is you can kind of form it into any shape you want to match whatever you need. So if you're trying to train like those intraosseous muscles that I was talking about before, like the Spock sign, you can put a little wad in between the fingers and practice that. Um, if you're trying to practice grip strength, you can squeeze down on the whole ball. So this one, I wouldn't just give you every exercise. It depends on what you need. I'm going to kind of cherry pick which ones you want. Now, some people don't like to deal with the, the putty. They just find it uncomfortable for whatever reason. So there always is um, this one option on the right. This is called, um, I think it's called a, uh, a power mat or something. I can't quite remember the name, but basically it's, it's a, an elastic um, rim with a bunch of holes in it. And you can get them in various strengths. You can even get them split in half where one side is you know, difficult and one side's easy. And what you do is you, you um, do various exercises, depending on your injury, which your, your chiropractor would be more than willing to assess and, and give you which exercises you need. Um, and then you can strengthen those, those smaller, more intricate muscles in the hand. Okay, um, and that pretty much covers what we're gonna talk about for the hand. So um, a big thank you to AST. The website is here, um, their YouTube as well, if you wanna catch any of the previous videos, their Instagram, they're always on there uh, sharing some good stuff too. And if you wanna ever get a hold of me, um, Instagram, I'm at dr.evansteinke, or if you wanna come say hi, meet me at Westman Village. Uh, I'm there a lot. You can call in, book an appointment with me. I'd love to see uh, anyone, even if it's just to say hi. Thank you so much for everything, um, Dr. Stanky. That was um, lots of information and it's quite remarkable uh, part of our body, looking at our hands and seeing all the complexity in there. It's uh, definitely, yeah. I appreciate. <laughs> it's a lot. Um, it really is, it's amazing. Um, and the parallels with the animals, that was quite neat, seeing the different animals and mammals that we have. Uh, yeah, similarities all over, yeah. Yes. Um, there are a couple questions. Um, sure. One is, uh, what are your thoughts on collagen powders for joint care? Okay, yes. So typically, like, it, it kind of depends on, on the person's uh, overall state. If, if you're in like a healthy state, I would say that you probably are not necessarily needing to start this in as like a regular supplement, but if you're, um, you know, getting into, I'd say anywhere into kind of your forties and up, or if you're starting to have joint pain, then yeah, I would, I would consider adding it, right? Because um, it can provide some benefits in terms of, of joint health, but if you're, you know, kind of going through life without issue, I wouldn't necessarily start it. For, for just the reason of, of adding it, right? Like some of us, um, you know, like vitamin D, it's kind of broadly recommended to everyone. I wouldn't, I wouldn't give it this kind of blanket recommendation. I would say if, if it's something that um, applies to you, then by all means, um, yeah, I, I, would, I would consider adding that into your routine. Thank you. Um, the, I think there were a couple questions and- um, Okay. The, uh, Sandra, if you want, speak on it a little bit more i'll ask and then we can elaborate if need be okay um so the the following question uh what about unflavored jello i do believe the nutritional reason why um that is being asked um in aligned with the collagen powders like would you actually maybe sandra would you mind um piping in and asking or adding where that came from did you mean to put the collagen into unflavored jellos or was that, uh, yeah, I'm not seeing her here. Oh, um, oh, it's a traditional Mexican, in traditional Mexican food, they eat it unflavored. So jello for joint oh, care. Yeah, so, yeah. so okay. if, if okay. I understand correctly, gel gelatin um, or, or jello has a fair amount of collagen in it. So again, it would be, um, practical to associate that with, with, with joint health, right? So it doesn't have to be a supplement. You could get it through your foods like uh, jello, right? So yeah, I would say by all means, if that's, if that's your means of getting collagen, yeah. And I, I didn't know that that was a traditional uh, Mexican food, but that's pretty cool. Neither, neither did I. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. 
And the collagen peptides is what you recommend. So that's, that's kind of all linked in the same questions. Um, that's what we're looking for when we're looking for collagen to help. Um, yeah, there, there's, there's various supplements that we will recommend. Um, just collagen peptides is one of them. But what um, so, sometimes there, there are other more refined recommendations. Again, I would I'd rather somebody come in and I speak like more specifically to their case on that. But if, if you're just looking for collagen in general, yes, you can get that collagen peptide supplement or you can go for something like the Jello, totally uh, viable options for both. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, are there any more questions? I'm not seeing any other than um, comments. Another amazing talk. Thank you, oh. Dr. Stanky. And I agree. Thank you. Thank you so much for your information. Um, this is the last in the three-part uh, upper extremity lecture series. Um, there'll be more coming in the fall, I believe. We just don't have some uh, specifics with dates. Um, yeah. I should say there's more coming from Dr. Evan in the yes. fall. We yeah. just do not have the specifics. Um, so please check your newsletters um, for upcoming uh, topics. If you have any topics that you're curious about or you think you may want to learn more, um, we are always open. Just um, when you get the follow-up email, you there's going to be uh, feedback. Go into the feedback. Let us know what you want to know. Um, and we will gather the information and absolutely put lectures together based on uh, totally. interests of our yeah. patients. Love, love the feedback. So yeah, yes. by all means. Um, I think that is all I have to say. Um, just another thank you for, ever, for everyone's time and attention. Um, thanks, Dr. Stanky, for all your wonderful information and efforts in this lecture series. Yes. And Perfect. have a wonderful night, everyone. And get outside and enjoy uh, this beautiful sunset. Will do. Okay, thank you so much. Bye for now.